building uh, off of Highway 14 in the Power Center. It's insulated by businesses. It's in a great location. It sits on four acres, plenty of room to grow. And the vision for phase one is coming together. And our due diligence, our inspections are coming together. We haven't found anything that would turn us away from the building thus far. Um, but as you can see, and it's kind of squeezed. It doesn't actually look like that. It's, 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 it's squeezed right now. But if you, if you look at when you walk in, you can walk in through a lobby. And all this in the front is supposed to have high ceilings all the way to the... I guess the rafters, and then you have a sanctuary door right here, uh, sanctuary over here, green rooms on either side of the sanctuary, all this area here is for fellowship, uh, where we can hang out together with our families before the service, after the service, kids check-in is conveniently located right here, so everybody would have a safe check-in, kids will have their own sanctuary, have plenty of classrooms, the youth will have their own space, uh, over here, they'll have their own bathrooms and a kitchen over here for them to do what they have to do. One thing that's very important for visitors and for you, that you have adequate bathrooms. Well, these are some of the biggest bathrooms I think you can get. I mean, they're huge. We have plenty of office space, which we'll be redoing this uh, to fit the needs of the staff members. And the other side of the building actually isn't a blank canvas. It actually has like 12 or 13 classrooms. And we've been praying about, and I've been seeking wise counsel about a school or a, a daycare to start out with like a Mother's Day out or a preschool, pre-K 3, pre-K 4, and get our feet wet. How many know that good schools are needed today, that, that honor Jesus, that will actually say the Pledge of Allegiance, that will stand for what we are supposed to stand for, amen? So we're praying about this, and matter of fact, when I was praying, because I've never done that before, God put a, a man of God in my heart that was a, a associate pastor over a very large ministry. We've been friends for about four years, and I called him, and there was a reason I called him. I didn't know about this, but when I asked him, I said, do you know anything about this area? He says, yeah, whenever I was the executive pastor, uh, assistant executive pastor over this church, he said that my responsibility, one of my responsibilities was for the um, the daycare or for the, the school, and so He's seen what works and what doesn't work, and so we're meeting, and we're talking about an agreement where he will kind of consult us and help us through this process and all the due diligence. But this is a way to where not only will we have access to meet new families and minister to more people. You see that? So by having the school, we'll get access to, to more people, minister to more kids and everything, more families that would be drawn and interested in the church. Amen? So who's excited about this right here? Amen. I mean, it, and like I said, it's a it's a squeezed version. It's 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 wider than that. But um, hey, man, I just wanted to show you that. Um, all right, how many of you were were here last time? Wait a minute, some of you were here last time. Okay, well, we're going to enter a new series today. Um, and the title of the message is going to be "Seize the Day." Everybody say, seize the day. Y'all awake today? Maybe you need a small joke. You want to hear a joke first? This is one of my kids' jokes. It's real good. You ready? So w why does a cow wear bells? My little girl would say, because his horns don't work. <laughs> Some of y'all already knew that one. Some of y'all get that one on the way out. <laughs> Some of you like, what's he mean? What's he talking about? Amen. All right, but we're going to be talking about seize the day. This was downloaded in my spirit because we talk about these principles, but I want to put it, I want to put it together, and really it's, it's a four-step. You know, I normally don't teach in, in four points, but today it'll be, it's actually three points, and the fourth one is really just putting action to the three points. Amen? But <coughs> if you take what I'm going to teach you today, if you will take this and you will make it a part of your life, you will never be the same. If you will take these three steps that I do daily, when others are in fear, when others are scared about provision, about the market, about everything else, you will be as bold as a lion and fearless. If you will apply these 
things I'm going to teach you today, which some of it's not a deficiency of knowledge. Some of you are going to know some of these things because we've talked about them. But putting it today, putting it together today in what we do first, what we do before the day is coming at us. See, most people, you know what they do? They wake up, the first thing they do is they grab the cell phone and all the blips from Fox News and all the negative things, and it's already coming at them. And then their thought process goes to, well, how am I going to get the rent done? How am I going to get this done? How am I going to get the kids here? How am I going to do this? How am I going to, 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 how am I going to? And you're just juggling all these thoughts, and that was never supposed to be the first thing on your mind. Amen. And we're going to hit a few scriptures here, but the first thing on our mind was supposed to be to first seek the kingdom. We're going to talk about what that really looks like and, and what we're supposed to do and why we do it. And I'm going to hit some scriptures on the benefits inside those things. And I'm hopefully going to pack it all in a 45-minute big old whopper for you to eat. Amen. Most people wake up and they let life happen to them. Life was never supposed to happen to you. Life was supposed to come from you. Amen. Amen. There were things that are illegal for you even to think on based on Jesus. So, so let's just go to Matthew. Let's go to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6 verse 25 says this. Jesus is speaking, red letters. says, therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life. Some of you should be getting convicted right now. Right? Because <laughs> what we do when we wake up, we take every thought for our life. How am I going to do this? How am I going to do that? How am I going to, what am I going to wear? Where, you know, how's this? How am I going to, how am I going to, how am I going to? Everybody say, how am I going to? That's going to be the word of the day. You remember Pee Wee's Playhouse, they had the word of the day, and everybody, when they said it, it was like, ah, so how am I going to, ah. Yeah, so how am I going to, how am I going to, how am I going to? So we're, 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 look, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but God already showed me, because he told me to teach you this message, that most of, most of, most of you in here, when you wake up, you are taking many thoughts for your life. Now, did Jesus tell us to do that? Mm -mm. So let's keep reading here. He says, therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life. What you shall eat, what you shall drink, uh, nor for your body, what you shall put on, is not life more than meat and the body uh, than raiment. Verse 26. He said, behold, the fowls of the air, for they, they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather in barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them, are you not better than they? Verse 27, which of you, by taking thought, can add one measure or cubit of stature, and it's talking about to your life. One translation says to your life. So what Jesus is saying so far is don't take thoughts for your life, and then he's challenging you. He says, by you taking all these thoughts, what are you adding? What you're usually adding is fear worry and doubt and God doesn't work through your fear your worry or your doubt can I get an amen in the house yes. uh, am I talking to somebody today I, I hope I'm not the only one because whenever I fail to do what I'm going to teach you today and life happens comes at me the day wasn't seized it wasn't purposeful things were not accomplished how many ever lived on that street mm -hmm. verse 28 says and why take ye thought of raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. Verse 29. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Verse 30. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall not much more clothe you. And what does he say? O oh, ye of little faith. So Jesus says when we take thought for the day, whenever we are uh, trying to add measure to our life by worry thoughts, when we do this, he says we're of little faith. So Jesus is saying this is the backward church. This is doing thing backwards. Okay, verse 31. Here we go. Therefore, take how many thoughts? This is Jesus. Is he your Lord? then it's time to stop taking all these thoughts. He says, take no thought. And look what he says here. He says, quit taking these thoughts because it's going to end up into words. And then you start saying things and you will start bringing to birth things that are not what God wants for you. Therefore, take no thought saying. Thoughts 
produce pictures. Pictures produce words. Words produce your future. Take no thought saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or wherewithal shall we be clothed? So basically, you can sum it all up in that. How am I going to provide for myself? How am I going to get the kids taken care of? What about the college fund? Uh, What about the job? What about this? Jesus said, this is illegal. Quit thinking like this. Verse 32. For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth what you need of all these things. Isn't it good that we know God knows what we need? It says he knew what you needed before you asked. So here's a hint. In your prayer time, don't talk about all the problems. Just talk to him about the solutions. 30 minutes of talking about your problems was pointless. The one that saw the end from the beginning can help you with the solutions. I'm going to say amen. Okay. Verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things that you've been worried about, that you've been concerned about, what does he say? They shall be added unto you. Put your hand on your chest and say, I am the seeker. I ain't the adder. My job is to do the seeking. God's job to do the adding. Let me tell you this. When you wake up, if you just stop doing your morning worry and rituals of watching the news, And simply just do not think on those thoughts and just say today, I trust you, Lord. This day was won before it was done. You had more faith to go out and do great things than sitting there and juggling all these thoughts that are going to probably just put you in depression and in your bed. I mean, if you look at the economic climate and everything that's going on in the world, you won't have any faith. What did Jesus say when they were on the boat? He was sleeping. They were freaking out because the storm was brewing. Jesus wakes up slowly and is like, why y'all freaking out? He says, peace be still. The storm stopped. And then he looked at them and he says, why is it that you have no faith? Because they took their eyes off of Jesus, the word of God, and put their eyes on economic winds and troubles and atmospheres. Amen? But God is above all those things. He's master and Lord of all. Amen? Amen? Getting your rent paid is no problem for God. Faith is that I don't take all these thoughts of the world, of worry, of fear, but I take the thoughts of God, amen, and I think on those things. All right. Am I talking to somebody here today? All right. Here's a base scripture. Ephesians 5, 15. We're going to read through 16, too. It says, see then that you walk circumspectly not as fools but as wise verse 16 redeeming the time because the days are evil so one point of this is redeeming the days or redeeming the time another translation says buying back the time because the days are evil well how do we do that it was found in the verse before when it says that we should walk circumspectly everybody try to say that word Oh, good, you do better than me. But I said, Lord, King James, I need a better translation. Diligently. Everybody say diligently. And you can't walk diligently unless you're walking purposefully. You got that? So the way we're going to buy back the time is we wake up on purpose. Amen? Not I'm waking up at 10 or 11 o'clock and the day's already passed me by and now I'm trying to play catch up. You ain't ever going to do anything for God that way. Did I say that? No, you're going to really struggle because you are not waking up on purpose. So we have to buy back the time. You know, I asked God when I started the ministry, I was still working a lot. I said, Lord, you're going to give me more time? He says, no, son, there's no more time. I want more of you. So I'm here to give you the same word. You know, the same word he he spoke, when he spoke it to me, same word for you. I'm here to tell you, there ain't no more time. God wants more of you. And he said, first seek the kingdom. Not thoughts about the job, not thoughts about the dog, not thoughts about the kids, not thoughts about anything, but first seek the kingdom. Well, first off, who's in the kingdom? Father, Son, Holy Ghost, our God, he's one, amen? So we need to seek God. 
his way of doing things. Amen? So we're going to hit point number one. Point number one has subpoints in it, but point number one is what you were restored for. And a lot of us don't think. See, a lot of the world or a lot of the church thinks that we, we were, when we got born again, that God was, was basically exists to serve me. Well, I'm sorry to bust your bubble. We exist to serve God. And the number one reason that God restored us is so we could have unbroken fellowship, so that we could have restoration between God and man. Hello? But see, we think God was created a lot of times. We wake up and, you know, we seek his hand. What you got for me today, Lord? I need my rent. I need this. I need that. You give him all your laundry list. But there's no intimacy. There's no really seeking God. You're seeking your, his provision. You haven't sought him. And, you know, <laughs> you ain't playing the game like Solomon did. Solomon was wise. He never looked at God's hand. He looked at God's face. And he said, Lord, I want the wisdom that you have. God was like, finally, finally. Somebody's not asking for money. They're not asking for riches. They're not asking for me to kill their boss or their enemy, as he said it. He's asking for wisdom. <gasps> and he said, son, because you've asked for wisdom and you haven't asked for all these other things, you're going to get it all. Because when you have God's wisdom, then he can trust you with it all. But as long as all you seek is this, God said, they ain't ready for the exceedingly abundantly. They ain't ready for it. Because they're not asking for it. And if you ain't asking for it, God says you ain't ready for it. Oh. So point number one, we're supposed to first seek the kingdom, but in point number one, and it can be encompassed with this, when we wake up, we should be thankful, we should be praising, and we should be worshiping. So point number one is thank, praise, worship. And you might be thinking right now, oh, come on, pastor, this is really, I'm telling you, this will set the tone for everything. You were recreated to have fellowship with your heavenly father, and you you don't have to raise your hand, but right now, if, if, if we were to be able to shut all the eyes and I could just, just get you to raise your hand, I know there's a lot of people in this room that you are not first seeking God's face. You've been seeking provision. You've been seeking his hand. You've been seeking all the wrong. You've been looking for love in all the wrong places, as they call it. But you have not sought out intimacy and communication with your father. And so that things are backwards. You didn't put the right things in order, so things are out of order. And you wonder why you're struggling. We got to do things God. Got to do things God's way. And let me tell you something. When I put this into practice in my life, and I will wake up on my face, Amen. And I will start the day with worshiping God and blessing God. See, worship isn't asking God for my laundry list. Worship is blessing the Lord, Amen. It's one thing that He's blessed us, but worship is blessing Him, Amen. But th there's there's. And I'm not trying to give us a religious pattern here, but if I don't tell you exactly what I do and how I do it, then how can you do it, right? So I'm going to break this thing down. So Psalms 104 is something I stand on. Psalms 104 says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. So the first thing I do when I wake up is in this scripture, I thank him. Everybody say thanks. Well, what do we thank him for? You better not be asking that. But just if you did, go to um, James 1.17. James 1.17 says this, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness. Everybody say, God don't change. Neither shadows of turning. So every good thing in your life, your shoes, your clothing, your health, the breath in your lungs, the children you have, I don't care. Something good, it all came from God. You got that? So when I wake up, I'm thanking him for everything. Amen? Because I found out a long time ago that nothing good comes from a complaining heart. Nothing good comes from an a, 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 a angry heart. Good things come from a thankful heart. Amen. When the heart is thankful, it's open to receive other things, right? But a hard heart, it ain't ready to receive nothing. You got that? So I don't go to God with hard-heartedness or all these things. I go with thanks. Psalms 104, we can actually go back to that. 
We thank him. I wake up and I start to thank him for everything good in my life. It says, enter his gates with thanksgiving. You can write this down. God lives in a gated community. And the gate code is thanks. It's not grumbling. It's not, how am I going to pay my rent? It's not, uh, meet all my needs, Lord. It's not that. It's thanks. Until you can thank him for what you have, you won't effectively be able to ask him for what you need. Hello? All right. Then it says something else. It says, enter his courts with praise. Praise. And I want to say this. Write this down. We praise God for what he has done. So you understand that. We praise God for what he has done. One, one scripture says, praise his holy name. Well, you say, well, that's his name. But every name that they gave God reflected what he had done. So whenever he was provider, they named him my God that provides. Now, they did it in Hebrew, but we can, it's okay to say it in English, right? All right? The, and when he healed, they said in Hebrew, the God that healeth thee. You got that? So every name of God, so when you praise his name, you're actually praising him for what he's done. You got that? Now, worship, we, we worship him for who he is. You got that? We praise him for what he's done, and we worship him for who he is. Notice that praise and worship have nothing to do with me getting my feel good or anything about me. It was about God getting glory and his feel goods. Amen. How many of you have children? When your child would come up to you and just bless you and say, Mom, you're the best. You're so sweet. You're so awesome. I, I just love you. Thank you. How'd that work for you? Later on, whenever they said, Oh, by the way, can I go to my friend's house? You're probably, oh, you go ahead, girl. You go. Go. I'll send you with some snacks, too. Well, God created you, kind of created you the same way. But then when your kid wakes up and says, Mom, you never do nothing. You never cook me breakfast. You never do this for me. You never do that for me. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, blah, blah. Can I, can I get five bucks to go do this? No, get away from me. Now you know how God feels. <coughs> All right, so I hope you got this. We praise him for what he's done, and we worship him for who he is. Now I want to give you a scripture. So, you know, Solomon... How many of you like Solomon? And we can learn a lot from Solomon, right? So Solomon just got the blueprint from God on how to build the temple, right? He got the blueprint, and now we're, we're further down where now he's got the praise team, and they got their instruments and everything. And I want to show you something fabulous about praise here. And um, <coughs> let's go to, uh, where was I supposed to go here? Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 12. We got it? There we go. And all the Levitical singers, and I ain't going to name them. You go for it. We just say that guy, that guy, that guy, and that guy. And their sons and their kinsmen arrayed in fine linen with cymbals. So they had instruments, cymbals, harps, lyres, uh, stood east of the altar with 120 priests who were trumpeters. Maybe we need a trumpeter. Anybody play the trumpet in here? Verse 13. And it was the duty of the trumpeters and the singers to make themselves heard Look at this word, in unison, in unison, or as one, in praise and thanksgiving to the Lord. And when the song was raised with the trumpets and the cymbals and the other musical instruments, in praise to the Lord, for he is good, for he is steadfast, uh, love endured forever, the house, the house of the Lord was, look at this, was filled with a cloud. And look at the result of this cloud, verse 14. So that the priest could not stand to minister because the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. Now, the, God lives in us. You're the temple now. But when you praise, how many of you have ever been praising and the glory started to fill you up? There's a difference. It does something to you. It prepares you to hear from God. It prepares you to talk to God. <laughs> Psalms 22 and 3, and I'll just sum it up. It says God inhabits the praises of Israel or the praises of his people. He inhabits the praises of his people. <sighs> Look at John 4, 23. 
Some of you saying, well, I've never had that kind of encounter with God. Well, I'm going to tell you, do it God's way. Verse 23 here says, but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father, look at this, is seeking such to worship Him. You know what that tells me? You don't really have to look for God because He's looking for true worshipers. If you will become what He wants or what He's seeking, He will find you. He hovers over the face of the earth, I believe, every day looking for somebody whose heart is towards Him that will put Him first. But you know, He doesn't find a lot of that. He finds a lot of Americans that are waking up stressed, thinking about their jobs, thinking about their bosses, thinking about all the nonsense which Jesus told us not to think about, but they have not yet thought about God. And you don't have to raise your hand right there, but you know who I'm talking to. And then maybe on the way to work or somewhere, maybe God's a distant thought, but they are drowned by the wrong thoughts. Their life is not on purpose. They are heavy. They are burdened. They are wore out. They are stressed. They are laden. And some of them wanting to check out. God's, God showed me. The spirit of suicide is getting big. Why? Because your life is out of order. You were never supposed to put all these things before the main thing. And the reason that you have not yet got on your face in the morning and worship God is because you've put no value on it. You, you've, not, you, you've not yet believed that God saw the end from the beginning. You've not yet believed that one instruction from God can change your whole existence. That the wisdom of God is greater than rubies and pearls and riches and all the nonsense you're chasing after. I mean, one divine appointment from God can set you up for life. Shout me down if I'm wrong. A lot of businessmen that serve the Lord will tell you it was that one divine encounter where God told me to go there, to that place, to talk to that person, that everything opened up for me. But if you're too busy about the adding, you can't be busy about the main thing. And the main thing, Jesus' blood poured out for you was so that you could see the Father face to face, so that you could seek His face. What does your Bible say? Go boldly to the throne room of grace in your time of need. Boldly. Not chase after the job and all these other things. Now let me give you Mark 135. Jesus. And in the morning, rising up a great while before the day, he went out and departed into a solitary place. Another translation says a desolate place. Everybody say, no distractions. And there he prayed. Now, you might say, yeah, he prayed. But, but look at me. He prayed. This word was prosuchioma. The word means worship. Think about this. Jesus was already the Son of God. The Father lived him. The Father did the works. Jesus didn't need anything. He was the son of God. He wasn't going to get on his face to ask for a laundry list of stuff. We are sons of God. He's already given us inheritance. We shouldn't be asking for a laundry list of stuff. This prayer was the most highest prayer. He was out there worshiping his dad, blessing his father. He would bless the father. And like I say, the prayer of worship should be 30% us, but then the other percentage should be God. Amen. 30% you, 70% God. Why is that? Because he should be talking to you. You bless the Lord and you get quiet. Have your notepad ready because something heavy coming down. When you go to God just to bless him and say, Lord, I just want to know what you have for me. He may talk to you about some things that need to come off you. He may talk to you about that. But that's okay. That's okay. We need to lay off every sin that so easily entraps us that's slowing us down. But most of the time, he'll tell you how much he loves you. Most of the time, he'll tell you about what's coming up in your future. You know, I'll tell you this. It was the end of the year, 2019, and I was on my face doing this very thing. 
it's not just a daily thing, but at the beginning of a year, I do a lot of this because I'm seeking God for the, for the next year and where we're going. And one of my desires is now fulfilled right now. What was that? That God would lead me to a pastor like Curry Blake so that the systems that he had that I didn't know about that would take us to a greater level of discipleship in action in doing the mission of God. Instead of being a sitting church, we, have we are fulfilling more of the mission now than ever. We're a doing church. And God brought me to Curry. I didn't have Bob, Susie, or anybody tell me about Curry. I would have never found him had I not went to the Lord. Are you hearing me? Now, he's my pastor, but what he's teaching me, he also is coming through here and helping you. It's all beneficial. He showed me many other things. He showed me some of the businesses that were coming. He, he had downloaded in my heart a, a vision of not just having a, 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 a ministry that was dependent on, on, and this is not ugly, on people, but to where it was self-sufficient because it had a system to fund, to fund it to where no matter what, you know, it's God works through people and he wants to, but sometimes people are fickle and they change. God ain't changing. So to set up systems that help us to where we can do it right without being bound by if people are changing in that season and, and many other things. But it would have never happened had I not been on my face. Before I, before I asked Amanda to marry me, I got on my face. I did this very thing. I didn't want to make a mistake. I was before the Lord. I said, Lord, I said, I'm feeling your peace about it, but I need a definite. I need something outside the norm. Is it okay I ask that? And I didn't get an answer till the next day, 24 hours later. My phone rings. One of my friends, his wife, she was in her prayer closet about the same time as me. And she says, hey, I'm calling you because yesterday in my prayer time, my prayer time, all God kept saying was tell Barrett yes. Tell Barrett yes. What was my question? Lord, I know you don't pick our spouses. That would be unscriptural because when the spouse acts up, we blame you. <laughs> but I did see God give Adam choices. There are many good choices. Choose wisely, men, because a Jezebel will take you away from God, destroy your life. But I knew that, and I said, God, is she a suitable helper? You see her heart. I don't want to be deceived. Not that my wife's deceptive, but I just didn't want to make a mistake. And he had her call me the next day around, you know, whatever time and say, whatever you were doing yesterday, Whatever you asked for, apparently you wasn't hearing. God said yes. Right? I move forward. I'm just giving you some things. And there's other things, but in that time, that intimacy with God, you know, choosing the right wife is like choosing the right life. Okay? So when you're going before God, you need to ask, hey, is this, is this a good move for me? And if you don't hear, don't move. Amen? <sighs> But Jesus went up early to go bless the Father, and they had an unbroken communication in a desolate place where he could talk to his dad and his dad could talk to him. You seeing this? All right. Now let's go to Matthew 15, verse 21. I want to show you some powerful things in worship. <clears throat> then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. Verse 22, and behold, a woman of Canaan came out with the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. Everybody say, she asked. Look at the next verse, verse 23. But he answered her not a word. Say, he ignored. So she's being ignored, right? I want you to write that down in this verse. She asked, but she is being ignored. Now look at verse 24. The disciples, uh, he says, uh, she says, well, let's go ahead and do it in order. We'll read the rest of this. But he answered her not a word, and his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, she crieth after us. And those of you that don't understand this, Jesus was sent for the Jew first. Most of you know this. This ain't baby church. Jesus was sent for the Jew first. She was not a Jew. She was a Canaanite. And so they're like, hey, send her away. All right. Now verse 24, but he said, 
I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Look at verse 25. Then she came and worshipped him. Underline that. She worshipped him. This word does not mean that she danced around or anything. This word means that she bowed her knee and began to bless him reverence to God. You see in that? That's what it meant. I always saw a posture to worship. And in the word proskuneo, 60 times in the New Testament Greek, it was nose to the carpet, knees hitting the floor. A submission to God. Uh, a reverence to God. Amen? You see in this? <clears throat> and as she worshiped, she said, help me, Lord. Verse 26 but he answered and said, It's not meat to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. And she said, True, Lord, but the dogs eat the crumbs which come from their master's table. Verse 28. Then Jesus answered and said, Woman, great is thy faith. Basically, she got what she came for. She was a non-Jew. And the worship towards God, she became what God sought, what God is seeking for somebody to worship him. And it pulled Jesus out of the dispensation of the Jew first. And a Gentile got her needs met or got the request. But you are all children of God. How much greater does your heavenly father want you to worship him? But you see, this was, she was before Jesus and she had faith for somebody else. Non-covenant woman. It wasn't even for her specifically, but for somebody else. Are you seeing the irony in this? non-Jew, non-covenant person, and she's asking for somebody else, standing in the gap for somebody else, and she gets it. You are a covenant person, and when you go before the Father and you bless Him and y'all start communicating, you have a covenant. You see in this? And normally you're asking for you. He did it for a non-Jew and not even for that non-Jew. Are you seeing this? But she brought to Jesus what he wanted getting quiet in this believers meeting let's look at um, so in mark chapter 5 i'm going to move on faster mark chapter 5 we're going to skip down to verse 6 this is the demon possessed man okay demon possessed man we'll go all the way to verse 6 and but when he saw jesus afar off he ran and worshiped him Demon-possessed man, they used to break chains, do all this crazy stuff that nobody wanted nothing to do with. The demon in that person made the body run to Jesus and worshipped him. I want you to think about this. The demons have been with God for a long time. You know that, right? Because the angels were before we were here. You know that, right? Because the angel asked, what is man that you are mindful of him, right? Y'all got that? And we know that there was an eviction in heaven where one-third of the angelic beings were kicked out. You got that? All right. So we know they've been here from the beginning. So what I'm trying to say is they know what God likes. They know what to do. Whenever you know what your parent really wants so that they don't spank you, you're going to do that. Well, I know my kids do that. I know my kids do that. So look at this. But when he saw Jesus fall off and ran, he worshipped him, and he cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the... And look at this, Jesus, thou son of the most high God. This is a demon, right? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. The whole point of showing you this is even a demon knows what to do to try to not get spanked. You know, and, and they don't want really nothing to do with God. They made their choice. But yet, they know what God likes. They know what he's seeking. Well, pastor, why are we using a demon? Because I'm saying even the demons get it. But how much more does God want his kids that he paid a, a high price for to be restored to so that you could be like Jesus in a desolate place, having communication with God about your life? He wants to talk to you about your life. But it doesn't start with, hey, gimme, gimme, gimme. It starts with thanks. And I'm, here it is. You ready for the pattern? I wake up and I thank him till the praise comes. And then I praise him until the worship comes. When the worship comes, I'm on my face. And I'm just blessing him for who he is. And I just keep blessing him. And I do that in English and I do that in tongues. You got that? And then the most important part of this is there is a part where I shut my mouth. And I start to listen. You got that? 
not just with physical ears, but there's a bubbling up at times where he'll start speaking to me through chapter and verse sometimes. And then he'll start to roll in sentences. And some of you have been with us when we've actually done this corporately, and we'll all get together and we'll all start writing things down and say, hey, what'd you get from God? What'd you get from God? It's amazing. People that have never heard from God are hearing from God because you became what he's seeking, right? Or it's really you slowed down to finally let him get a word in. You put him first. He's always trying to talk to you, but you've not put any importance on that. So point number one is when we first seek the kingdom, we're going to thank him, we're going to praise him, and we're going to worship him. This is how we start our day. This is how you seize the day. We put God first. You got that? All right. Point number two, we're going to pray. All right. But this encompasses acknowledging his promises and meditating on his word. This has to happen. You got to do this without fail. Well, you don't got to, but you won't get the benefit if you don't. But first, we put first things first. We have intimacy with God. Now you're ready. Now you're ready to acknowledge. Now you're ready to read the word. You got that? And, and look, I know we have, uh, there's jobs, there's things, but look, some people I know you get up an hour early, go work out. Cut your workout 15 minutes. You can do this in 15 minutes. It doesn't have to be a never-ending event. Amen? Why do we do this? Because Philemon 1.6 says that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. So the promises are already said yes and amen to. It's our job to acknowledge it. It's our job to stand on it. So I'm going to take you to Proverbs, which totally hits all this out the park, so I can make this a timely point here. Proverbs 4.20 says, My son, how many sons and daughters I got in the house? Okay. My son, attend to my word. Incline thy ears to my saying. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of of thy heart. Verse 22, for they are life unto those who find them and healing to all their flesh. You know that some people got a medicine cabinet, right? <clears throat> Everybody say medicine chest. Well, I got a medicine chest too because my heart down deep in me, when I put the word in there, now I got a medicine chest. You got that? Down deep in my heart. I'm meditating on that word because it's life unto my flesh. Some people go to a cabinet for healing and what they need. I go to the word of God. And just like you can get a prescription from a doctor. You, how many of you know you get a script from a, a doctor that actually has something that may work? Okay. I'm not talking about a lot of these other doctors. But the doctor might have something that might actually fix something. Okay. And you know that one, if you never go get the script filled, it's not going to help you. Right. Number two, even if you get the script filled, but you never partake of the script, it ain't going to help you either. You got that? You got that? So too, if the Word of God stays in your Bible all the time, which the Word of God is healing to our flesh, answer to everything you need, if I never take time to fill the script, meaning, look, you don't have to have 20 scriptures, but if you find a solid three, that's good. Honestly, I just want you to know one real well that you don't have to go read your Bible that you're standing on. You got that? And you say, look, I don't have to have 20, devil. I got one. One's enough. And you're standing on that. You're acknowledging that. You're meditating on that. Amen? You're picking up what I'm putting down. <clears throat> so they, they are life unto those who find them and health unto their flesh. Verse 23. Look at this. It's a big one. Keep thy heart with all diligence. For out of it are the issues of life. What's he trying to say here? When you let the word of the devil or death creep in, death comes out. If you've been talking fear, unbelief, man, I'm so stressed out, I'm going to you know what, or this job is you know what in me, you need to stop saying all that. Hello? Hello? Because what you say is what you hear, and what you hear gets into your heart. And your, your spirit believes your words more than anybody. Hello? So we need to guard that. <clears throat> it goes on to say, verse 24, put away from the a forward, a froward mouth. Here we go, King James. Froward. Everybody say froward. 
and it doesn't mean you got a big afro, froward mouth, and perverse lips put far from thee. And I had to study that out, but basically that word in King James means quit talking wrong, meaning quit talking evil, quit talking bad, quit talking negative. And it goes on to say that, and perverse lips put far from thee. Perverse lips in the original language is basically anything that is not in agreement with God's word. But you know what happens in the morning when the alarm clock goes off? When people have not purposed what the main, most important thing in their life is to spend time with God? When it goes off, their thoughts go to every other thing and they start to say things. Because what did Jesus say? Take no thought for all these things. And he also said, take no thought saying. Because thoughts become words and words become your future. Well, God wants you to spend time with him so he can give you some words so they can produce thoughts so you can speak them so that your future will be what God wants. You seeing this? Okay. I know some of you are like, I kind of know this stuff. The reason I'm preaching is because you ain't been doing it. So I'm here, messenger of God, to say, hello, what you know don't matter. It's what you know and do that matter. You know, sometimes God's knocking on the hearts of the people, and they're like, you can keep on knocking, but you can't come in. So he sends me and says, tell them again. Tell them again. Put away from you perverse lips. Perverse lips. Anything that doesn't agree with God's word is perverse. Is perverse. I like what Brother Hagen said. Here's a quote. People that think wrong believe wrong. And when they believe wrong, they act wrong. Meditation is the key to cure your butt on God's word, his precepts, his principles, his truth. All right, point number three. We have to look at our vision and goals daily. Vision and goals are daily, which they're one and the same. But it ain't a vision if it ain't from God. You got that? It's not a vision if it's not from God. Now, I'm going to read a scripture. I'm going to read a couple of scriptures here, and then I'm going to say some things that God had put on my heart at a graduation. Actually, my brother that's in the room, some of these words God downloaded at a graduation, but I'm going to tell you what he told me to tell those kids because you need to hear it too. But first, Habakkuk 2.2 tells us, And the Lord answered me, said, Write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so that he may run who reads it. Meaning that the vision should cause people to run. Because if the vision's from God, normally it's bigger than you. Hello? Hello? Verse number 3. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. It seems slow. Wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Everybody say, write the vision down. It is biblical to write down the vision of God. Whenever I was in that prayer meeting in 2019, before I, I found Curry, I wrote everything down. I didn't find Curry the same moment. It was a few weeks after that when I was seeking after what I wrote down, where he was telling me to look. You got that? But I put action to it, which is point number four, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So everybody say, write the vision down. But you got to look at the vision daily. Daily. Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there is no vision, the people perish. <clears throat> perish. They cease to be. If you don't have a vision, you're kind of, you're already done. You, 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 got, you got nothing to move you forward. See, I remember when 2020 COVID broke out and a lot of preachers were saying, man, I was ready to preach this message about 2020 vision. All vision does is show you where you're going. If you don't know where you're going, you ready for this? All roads lead there. Say it again. If you don't know where you're going, all roads lead there. And we are waking up. We don't know where we're going and we're chasing our tails and wonder why we never get nowhere. Because you have not believed the word and wrote it down and are looking at it. But we got to keep it in order, though. Going to God, spending time with God, right? Follow? Okay. 
spend time in the Word. I'm going to acknowledge all, everything that I have in Christ Jesus. I'm going to meditate on those promises. Okay? <clears throat> all right. No vision, people perish. The word perish means to cast off all restraint, to go back into the old lifestyle, old habits. You know why most people serve sin? They never got a vision from God. When you got a vision from God, you won't be playing in sin because the vision will encapsulate you. It will take over you. That vision will, you'll have so much purpose and you're looking at where you're going instead of where you've been. How can you move to the future of God when all you do is focus on the past of where you were? Vision focuses you on the future of God. Thoughts of the past is the devil trying to focus you on the wrongs of the past. Okay. Perish. Lack of self-control, meaning they have no self-discipline. Vision, write this down. Vision gives birth to discipline. Some people say, I, I want to be a disciplined person. I believe you do. Nobody ever taught you how to be that. Well, I'm about to tell you, when you get a vision, vision brings discipline. You don't have discipline without vision. You know why most people are disciplined? Because they got a vision. They got a goal that's so big that it pulls on every minute of every day. They ain't got time to play. Vision gives birth to discipline. Discipline, write this down, is the key to success. But you can never have the key to success without a vision. Discipline is self-imposed standards or restrictions motivated by a desire greater than all other alternatives. I'm going to say that again. That's worth repeating. Self-imposed discipline, self-imposed standards or restrictions motivated by a desire greater than all other alternatives, meaning the desire to move towards the mark is greater than the desire to be complacent and live in lack, barely making it, things that will kill you. You got that? You hear what I'm saying? Discipline, it's a decision. Decisions determined by a designated destination. Write that down. Discipline, decisions determined by a designated destination. Because you know where you're going, you have become disciplined. A person has become disciplined when they know where they are going. And I just said this earlier. When you don't know where you're going, all roads lead there. Vision brings discipline to every area of your life. Vision brings discipline. Vision brings discipline to how you choose your friends. When you got a vision from God, you won't hang out with the guy who's going to pull you in the wrong direction. You ain't got no time for that. Matter of fact, I meet some of these people that are like, I'm always hanging out with my friends. I'm like, how you do that? I ain't got enough time in the day to do that. How you do that? Because I ain't got no vision. They got no vision. All roads lead to Joe's bar pool hall to go get drunk their, their motivation is i'm going to work so i can go buy beer that's their motivation good job good job a boatload of grace for nothing vision brings discipline to how you choose your movies or entertainment when you got a vision from god you won't go pay attention to things that won't profit you or help you become what you need to become to fulfill that vision because the vision puts pressure on you to conform to the image of God. Hello? Vision brings discipline to how you choose your priorities. Vision brings discipline in how you choose your hobbies. Vision brings discipline to your finances. Some people are like, man, I get money and money goes. Because you are not yet, you don't have a vision. When you have a vision, you will start to make money your slave. Because those dollars will have a purpose towards the vision. Versus, well, I really ain't got nothing to do it for, with you. So I'll just go blow you on what I like. Versus on what God likes. When you have a vision, you won't spend all, your, all you make. Vision chooses where your money goes before you make it. Write that down, somebody. Vision chooses where your money goes before you make it. No vision. You wake up. And you blow it because it has no purpose. Vision brings discipline to what you listen to and the books you read. Vision chooses, oh, oh, 
the Lord. Okay, all right. Vision chooses your diet. Because if the vision is for you to live 100 years, you can't commit suicide by fork. I, I got a little amen, but amen. I can't, right. Pastor, get off. Get out of there. Get out of there. Um, if the vision is to, I wrote this down. If the vision is to 80 years old, you will not commit suicide by a junk food diet. And then write this down. You ready for this? This is heavy. What's a vision without you in it? It ain't a vision. <laughs> Hashtag take care of your temple. All right? So you ready for this? Just write this last statement down. Vision gives birth to discipline, and discipline is the key to fulfilling vision. Got that? All right. Paul backs this all up. 1 Corinthians 9, 24. He says, do you not know that in a race all runners run, but one, run, one runs to receive the prize? You got that? One's running to receive the prize. All runners are running, but somebody's running with purpose. He says, so run that you may obtain it. Verse 25, every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath. But we an imperishable. Verse 26. So do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. Verse 27. You ready for this? But I discipline my body and I keep it under control. Lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Paul believed in self-discipline, in buffeting his body. But Paul had a big vision. What was his vision? Build homes, preach the gospel. He built tents and sold them, and he set up churches. He had that vision. And at the end of his life, he said, I've, I've kept the faith. I've run the race. I've done, basically said, I've done what I was supposed to do. Right? Right? All right. So, again, point number three we just talked about it, was that we need to look at our vision or our goals daily, daily. All right, number four, write this down. You ready for this? Massive action. Massive action. James 1.22 tells us, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. You can spend that time in your prayer closet acknowledging and saying all these things, but never act upon it, and it will produce nothing for you. You can have a vision and never go actively act upon it, and it will do nothing for you. Verse 23, for if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. Verse 24, for he beheld himself and go away straight for, straightway forgetting what manner of man he was. Verse 25. But whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty, underline this part, and continue therein. So I looked into the word, but now I continue therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This man shall be blessed in his deeds. You seeing that? Number four. Massive action. Amen? Now, Pastor Mike is going to come down here with a hot mic. Amen? You can go ahead and stand on your feet. <coughs> and stand on your feet. Pastor Mike's going to come on down here, and he's going to close out the service for me. And since this is our first transition, I'm going to go ahead and fill in some of the gaps here. <laughs>